this morning we pray particularly for this nation as we get close to Pentecost. Would you send rain over this land? Would you rend the heavens over this nation? Would you visit us once more again? Would you change the hearts of people? Would you bring transformation and revival in our land, God? Turn the hearts of people to you, O oh God. Break our hearts for the things that break your heart, O oh God. Bring healing and hope where there is none. And as we speak your word this morning, would you, Lord, speak through us? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, this morning, uh, we started last week a series on preparing for Pentecost. And last week, we focused on just looking at, at our hearts, which is a place where revival actually takes place. Because God cannot really work any real thing until he walks it in the inside of us. And so last time we started looking at our hearts and asking God to break our hearts and create this fallow ground, let it become tender, let us, that fallow ground be broken. So this morning we are going to continue in part two of that series. And I'm going to read our text, our scripture reading from the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8 to 12. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 to 12. The Bible says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and on to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Then suddenly, two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, the Sabbath they walk from the city. Uh, I'm going to push my thing a little bit higher, my makeshift pulpit. The text, uh, today we are celebrating Ascension Day, and I felt like this text was appropriate, not only for uh, our what we are going to talk about, but then also because it reminds us of how the disciples how Jesus ascended up into heaven before in the eyes of his own very disciples. And so let me first take a pause and congratulate all the servicemen and all the veterans in our church. Thank you all so much for your service. Thanks, Jim, uh, and those who are not here. Thanks, uh, Glenn. Thank you all so much. David. Thanks, David. Thank you all for your service. And for those in listening, thank you all uh, for all your incredible work and for serving and we can celebrate today because you, you laid your life down. And uh, there's no example like Jesus would have said. He laid his life for others. He sacrificed, and that's what you did. And thank you so much for that. And for those who are still on the front line, we are grateful for all your sacrifices and for all your services. It's, it's easy uh, as Americans to say this is a land of the free. But I think a better way is to say this is a land that has been bought with blood. Because when you say it's a land of the free, at times people take it for granted. I can do anything. But when you remember that somebody's life paid for it, then you take it a lot more seriously. So thank you all so much uh, for your incredible service. Uh, so as I said um, uh, this morning, so last week we looked at uh, breaking the fallow grounds. And we talked about the fact that most often as disciples, as believers, as Christians, the tendency is that we neglect to tend to our soul. And when we neglect to tend to our soul, our hearts can easily become a fallow ground. We become so busy with life, we become so distracted with the things happening around that we neglect our relationship with God. Or we just do it, and it's just one thing we do, but our hearts are no longer on fire. Our passion is no longer there. 
uh, when we do it the same experience that we had before, we don't feel it again. I'm not as if Christianity is a feeling, but when you have a relationship that is genuine with somebody, you can know that it's real and it's tangible. And, and at times, it's easy to become so familiar that we ne neglect and we ignore that place and that relationship with God. And so last week we said that it's important that we do that work in our hearts to break the fallow ground. And that was like the first point of our, sem of, of our series. And I feel like I will just summarize that that was a cleaning work we did last week. Last week we were doing a cleaning work, breaking that ground and cleaning up. And when we talk about the cleaning work, we are talking about Going, coming to a place of repentance, recognizing that uh, we have not walked in the way God expected us to walk. And, uh, and after we have done that cleaning work, and after we have done that um, work of, of transformation, I wanted to just read a few texts that um, uh, came back, that I felt like I, should, I wanted to just go back over it again from last week. Hosea chapter 10, that was like a key text. Chapter 10, verse 12 and 13 says, Sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. I think I like the fact that it didn't just say it is time to seek the Lord, but it's, it's a continuous seeking until the time I feel like, wow. I can feel like there is a rain of God's presence over my life. I don't seek him one day and stop. I seek him until he comes and showers righteousness on me. And he says, but you have planted wickedness. You have reaped evil. You have eaten the fruit of deception because you have depended on your own strength and your own warriors. How many times have we thought, I've got this? I'm very gifted, I'm very talented, I have it all covered. And because we have it all covered, we don't see God like we should. Or the only times we really seek him is when there is a, a, a crisis. But the psalmist says in Psalms 51 from verse 10 to 12, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold in me a willing spirit. How I wish that would be our prayer every day, creating me, O oh God, a clean heart. Because it's easy for our hearts to become sold. We live in a world with people who do stuff to us and it's easy to get upset. It's easy to want to walk in unforgiveness. It's easy to want to and it, it's not the big things, it's the little things that easily creep into our heart. And at times, our heart becomes hardened and bitter and weary and tired. Uh, but the psalmist says, God created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Do not, take, do not take me away from your presence because if I have everything but I don't have your presence, then life has no meaning and no essence. So that was just like a summary of the first week of last week. Uh, but then this week, I wanted us to go a little further. After we have had our house clean and our hearts are ready and our hearts are soft and the ground is tender, how, how do we prepare for this Pentecost? I think expectation becomes incredible. But you can't have expectation until you are able to look back to know what God did in the past. How can I expect something when I don't know how it's always been? Uh, back home in Cameroon, we have um, uh, an exam that we take in junior high, at the end of junior high, when you're finishing junior high, and then you also take it when you're finishing high school. It's a national exam. So it's the same exam for every student everywhere in the country. And uh, most often when you are going to prepare for the exam, the, your teachers will encourage you look for the questions for at least the past 10 years. And if you could review the questions and answer them and know how to deal with them. When you go to your exam room, the tendency is there might be the same question that shows up. The language might be different, but it's going to be the same question. So if you can go back and review the past 10 years and prepare yourself very well, there is no way you can fail for that exam. 
because you would there's an expectation you have there is you have an idea of what the exam always looks like and in the past generations in the past years there are things that god has done that is a result of pentecost there are things that the bible shows of what happened in pentecost but then we have also seen times when god moved mightily as a result of a fresh outpouring of his spirit upon his church and upon his people so when we have when we have an idea of what god did in the past we can know what to expect today so i wanted us to go back a little into history and just see what has god done in the past how has god shaped generations as a result of the outpour of the holy spirit upon his people and upon his church okay I think my notes are a little like <laughs> the first one is in the book of Acts uh, the Bible says in Acts 1 8 but you shall receive power is a text we read when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem in Judea in Samaria and to the ends of the earth the purpose for which the Holy Spirit comes is to empower us to witness that's that's the main key everything else is secondary the, the Holy Spirit's role is not to give us all the nice things of life. Yes, that comes as an extra, but number one is so that we become witnesses into the ends of the world. So when the day of Pentecost was, had come, when you remember, the, but these disciples were fearful. These disciples were weak. Peter had denied Jesus in front of people. But then suddenly on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they were together. Then the Holy Spirit came upon them. And... When the Holy Spirit came and people were like, oh, these guys are drunk. Peter started preaching. The Bible says on that same day, 3,000 people got saved and added to the church. Initially, when I looked at this text, I actually thought that, well, that has happened in the past, in the time of Jesus. You remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 and people followed him? But if you look at the Gospels very well, you realize that most of these people didn't really become disciples of Jesus. They came and they ate and ran away. They came, got a miracle, and disappeared. Because when Jesus told them, eat my flesh and drink my blood, the Bible says all of them left, except the 12. So they, even though they, had, they, had, they liked Jesus and they liked his teaching, they didn't have the empowerment it takes to live and follow and be a genuine disciple of Christ. But when Pentecost came, something supernatural happened. The Holy Spirit himself walked a walk in the hearts of the people who were listening to Peter. That 3,000 people, probably some of the people who had um, uh, crucified Jesus, probably some of the people who were making a mockery when they walked him up through Jerusalem streets, up to the, to the cross to be crucified. Probably some of those people. But because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, there was a conviction in their hearts. And they knew for a certainty they needed the Lord. So we, we see that in Pentecost, there was this great and mighty salvation of souls because of the power of the Holy Spirit that had come down. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to just read, Verse, 40, verse 41, the Bible says those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number. And in chapter, in verse 42, it says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were saved. I believe at times, especially in our generation, and I am guilty, is that we have looked a lot for the strategies to win souls. And most often we miss the power that brings transformation. Because the Holy Spirit knows how to convict people in a way that no human words can. The Holy Spirit knows how to, to meet somebody in their bedroom and they start feeling like, I think I need to change my life. I think I need a change of life. I, need, I think there's something wrong with me. I can't continue living like this. That is the work that only the Holy Spirit can do. And Methodists will call that a prevenient grace, where God starts chasing and pursuing people before they ever come to know the Lord. But that doesn't happen by mistake. It is because the saints 
start to pray and start saying, Holy Spirit, visit our town. Holy Spirit, visit our city. Holy Spirit, change families in our town. Holy Spirit, change families in our city. When the church starts to pray that, then God himself visits his people. The next example we'll see was John and Charles Wesley. And I'm going to read, read this, what I had in my note. Uh, church history tells us that John Wesley woke up every day at 4 a.m. and prayed up till 8 a.m. He prayed four hours a day, every day. And what is significant, it says, uh, Charles, this is a hymn by Charles Wesley. It says, Holy Ghost, no more delay. Come in thy temple stay. Now thine inward witness bear strong and permanent and clear. Spring of life thyself in part. Rise eternal in my heart. And, and this is something that Chris Rita, he's um, a, a Methodist, he's a Wesleyan theologian. And this is something that he write that I just I felt like was really good about Wesley, about Wesleyans. They say Wesleyans are Holy Spirit people. From its inception, the Methodist revival was a spirit-born resurgence of scriptural Christianity. The quote from the above Charles Wesley hymn is one of the countless examples that illustrate and emphasizes and depend dependence upon the work of God's spirit. John Wesley was criticized for many things, but perhaps the most common charge against him was his enthusiasm. His insistence on the direct, palpable, daily influence of the spirit of the Christian of the spirit in the Christian life rocked like a sandpaper against the dry, formal Christianity of his day. His consistent defense was that his gospel was nothing other than the faith of the apostles recorded authoritatively in the New Testament. I strongly believe that if John Wesley came to our church, most of our Methodist churches today and preached, we will call him extremist. We will kick him out. Because he was one of those who rubbed on the cold, liturgical, quiet church system of his days. He's one of those who were called names in his days because he believed in the power of the Spirit. How comfortable have we come, become? How much have we drifted from where we actually started? This movement that was born by the power of the Spirit, we have come to a place now that we have become so comfortable and it's our human ideas and human plans and human wisdom. And at times we plan so much that the Holy Spirit probably is sitting at the back and he's watching and saying, I wish one day they are going to invite me in. But when we look back and see what God did in the time of John Wesley, we are reminded that God wants to move again. I believe God wants to not just revive our church, but he wants to revive our denomination. He wants to stir up a fresh move of young men and young women. I don't know if you're not tired, but I'm tired of our young people leaving our churches. And when they go to college, they never step their foot in church. Because they were in church for so long, but they never encountered the God of the church. And it's not the fault of the young people. It is our fault. Because we became so comfortable. And we preached a gospel that was so nice. And so, but then nothing ever happened in the inside of them. They never knew the God of the gospel. And somehow I believe that God is calling us as a people, as a church, once more again. To go back to that place of prayer that activates the move of God, that activates the move of the Spirit of God. And lives are changed and lives are transformed. We might not have many kids in, in, in our congregation, but there are so many of them all over that we can be intercessors and ask God to encounter them. And ask God to change them and ask God to transform their lives. We also have movements like the first and the second great awakening and hybridist revivals and the Asbury revivals, the Azusa revivals, where people were flogging from their houses and just running to church. They didn't know why they were coming. Charles Finney would be coming into a town. I think I probably told the story. He would be coming into a town and maybe he would be just 
somewhere around Louisburg and everybody in Lacing was come going to the police station to report their crimes because of the heavy conviction of the spirit that was coming upon them. How incredible is that? That had nothing to do with a, a human being. It had something to do with people who were on their knees and saying, God, we need you once more. We need you to visit our land. We need you to visit our nation. We need you to visit our cities. But I think this one, Peggy and Christina Smith from the hybrid is the revival really caught my heart because I felt um, uh, it's easy. Most of our congregations are a little older and it's easy at times to say, well, I'm not young again. I can't go out and preach like, oh, like you want me to preach. But these were two women that I think we can copy from them. And if what happens if all of us in the sanctuary and those watching start doing what they did? The Bible, uh, uh, sorry, so the Bible says, <laughs> church history says, they prayed, I'm a Peggy and Christina Smith, they prayed the promise in the small cottage by the roadside in the village of Barbas lived two elderly women, Peggy and Christina Smith. They were sisters. They were 84 and 82 years old. Did anybody hear that? They were 84 and 82 years old. A lot older than almost all of us in this place. Peggy was blind and her sister almost bent double with arthritis. Unable to attend public service, their humble cottage became a sanctuary where they met with God. To them came the promise, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and float upon the dry ground. They pleaded this day and night in prayer. If you read the entire story, they prayed so much and then God started telling them, when it was time, God told them, call the pastors. And they were the ones telling the pastor, it's time to pray because a revival is coming to town. So you don't have to be a pastor to, to be used by God to birth for the movement that changes the entire city. When it was time for, for, for them to bring a minister, they knew the Holy Spirit told them. And they told the pastor, their pastor, I said, Pastor, would you invite a, a, an evangelist now to town? And when they, there was somebody who came first, they were like, no, that is not a person. When the second person came, they said, yes, this is a person. Why would they be so sensitive? Because their heart was passionate in prayer and asking God for a revival. And if what happens if we start to really make that kind of intercession for New Lancaster and for Lacing and for Lane County and saying, God, would you pour water on the dry ground? Would you walk a walk? And the hybridist revival lasted for so long. Farmers, people will be in their farm and just start fall on the ground and just start weeping and crying because a strong conviction will come upon them. And suddenly everybody on the farm will start crying and then they will call somebody to come and preach and they will all get saved on the farm. And they had to retrain their horses because their horses were taught to obey curse words. When they all got saved, they couldn't use curse words again. They had to retrain their horses because when they would say this, the horse would be like, what are you saying? I don't know what to do. They retrained their horses. Two elderly women. One blind. One bent over with arthritis. What, like, I mean, in my mind, I'm imagining which excuse do I have? Those are the, you say these are the weakest people in society. Why would God choose a blind 84 year old woman? A woman bent over with arthritis 82 years or who cannot walk to birth a movement in an entire city. I think he's wanting to let us know, Velma, you don't have an excuse. He says, I use the weak so that at the end of the day, nobody's going to say because you're a pastor, that's why I did it. To let us know that he can use anybody, anytime, in any place. And we can be used by him if we say, God, I'm available. So that is what God did in the past. So how, what is God doing today? Uh, there is, if, you, if you have time, there is 
there are some documentaries on transformations. If you, if you click transformation revivals, you will have several documentaries pop up of whole cities, of whole nations that have been changed and transformed. Um, in, in Colombia, a town called Cali, there was like drugs everywhere, just wickedness everywhere. People were being killed every day. But a group of people started praying and God moved in Cali and the drug law, the drug war, the, let's say the drug lords, all of them were arrested. The drugs went down. Like God just intervened and changed the entire city and there was just a revival and a movement that was birthed because some believers decided to pray. Not only is God working, not only did God work in, the, in, 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 in Colombia, but God is working in the global south. The global south is like where I'm coming from in Africa, in Asia, where people, like in South Korea, people go up the prayer mountain and just ask God, God, would you change our city? Rain upon our nation. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And what would happen if today we would start, just start praying that God, rain your spirit on us and I felt like so what is our responsibility I believe that God is calling us to become intercessors as we get ready for Pentecost to start praying and not just pray until Pentecost next Sunday to stop but to ask God to baptize us with a fresh grace to pray until our city is changed to pray until our nation is transformed and I thought what happens when we watch the news how do you watch the news when you watch the news is it just to get information and then criticize a leader on Facebook or does your heart break when you see how people are being killed? Does your heart break when you see the division among our politicians? Does your heart break when you see how people, the words, people who are supposed to be our leaders used against each other? Does, does something in the inside of you, does, does it mean anything? Or have we become comfortable and it has become like, well, that is it, that's America. I don't believe that is this nation. I don't believe that is it. I believe we've given the enemy a place so long that he's invaded and somehow the church has sat back and just watched and said well I can post it on Facebook but what if we started going back on our knees and saying God visit our land again visit our nation again change things around I'm tired of seeing seeing young people committing suicide i'm tired of the rate of young people elementary school kids on drugs i am tired i'm tired of teenagers wasting their lives i'm tired of families the abuse the the rate of murder i don't think there's any other nation except a nation with war where there is so much killing of ordinary People like you kill your own brother and sister. I believe it's time for the church to awake. My prayer is that in this, I'm sorry, that in this season of, of, of Pentecost, that God will stir up something in the inside of us that will not be comfortable. God wants us to change the nation, to change the system. It's not okay for a nation. Politicians don't change a nation. The church changes the, changes the nation. The believers, we do. We change our cities. We change our communities. We are the ones that God has called. So as we get ready for Pentecost, would you, you might not pray for everything in the nation, but can you pick one city? Can you pick one family? Can you pick one age group and say, God, you visit them? Can you pick maybe the people on drugs and say, God, would you set them free? But can you focus your prayer on just, maybe just a specific group on maybe on the children, on the schools? I strongly believe that whole cities can be transformed. I believe that with everything in the inside of me. I believe that God can move in Lacing and New Lancaster that People start running from their houses to our churches. I believe that God can so move that whether it's Tanglewood, whether it's the other uh, Lynn County where the people are on drugs and all of that, that they start abandoning their drugs and then just start hating, that they pick it and they want to try it. And somehow it just tastes so bad that they don't even want it again. 
I believe there's a place for rehab, but I also believe there is a place where the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon people and chains are broken from off their lives. I believe that. And it's because I know the word of God says that. But it only happens when the church of God is able to come together and rise and say, we cannot take this anymore in our town. We cannot take this anymore in our cities. Our kids and our grandkids, guess what? They are going to grow and they are going to go to our colleges. And they are going to be faced with things that if we don't pray, we never know. We want to be the ones who make intercession. We don't just want to pray, God protect our children. We want to say, God, change every other child. What happens if the environment is so healthy that our children go and we don't have to worry? So I pray that the Lord will just tear up something in our spirit and in our heart in this season as we enter into Pentecost that we are going to become intentional about the transformation of God in our land. Can we pray? Oh, Holy Spirit. We thank you for, for this nation. We thank you for this community, God. We thank you for Lacing, for New Lancaster, for Lynn County, for Kansas. We can't wait for that day, oh God, when there is no crime. There is no wickedness. There is no, when lives are so changed, God. In our communities, our people are running into your kingdom. We can't wait for that. But we know, God, you can't do it without us because you're looking for a man and a woman to partner with. And so we come, Spirit of the living God, and we say, Lord, we choose to forget the former things. And you say, behold, you do a new thing. Use us, oh God. Use us for that purposes. May we be your witnesses. May we be your intercessors for the nations. We avail ourselves to you Spirit of the living God, use us. Baptize us afresh with the spirit of grace and intercession. And may we not be complacent anymore. Break our hearts for the things that break your heart. And may we be your church indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Jackie, your son.